Got it. Finally. So, um, Casey, tell us a little bit about, we did a, a quick little intro um, earlier for anyone that got the um, invita invitation to join us tonight, but we meet every last Thursday of the month. And today, Casey is bringing his experience from Dallas, Texas. And um, tell us a little bit about your journey in real estate, Casey. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, first of all, appreciate you having me on here. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet for you, but, uh, I am, uh, about eight years into the business and by business, I say, you know, I actually intended on just investing in real estate out the go, decided to get my real estate license down the road, become an agent and, you know, turn that into a job all in itself. But, as far as real estate investing goes, I started uh, getting my feet wet, uh, you know, kind of doing these things, jumping on, you know, Zoom calls, meeting people at local meetups, uh, just learning as much as I can back in 2016. Um, and I've scaled, you know, over the course of the last eight years to uh, acquire about six million in assets. None of that's partnered or uh, you know, joint ventures or anything. All of that is solely owned by me and uh you know, purchased, uh, on my behalf. That's so awesome. And so inspiring to hear, um, you know, every month we cover slightly different topics. Often the topics tend to, um, gravitate back towards financing, which is such a common, um, challenge that people think People often think the biggest challenge that they're going to have with real estate investing, especially when they hear a story like yours, Casey, of that big number, $6 million, is where does this money come from? How do you get started? How do you fund these things? So, um, you know, that is often one of the topics that we go back to. So we have all of these sessions recorded and, um, and we cover different topics from month to month, whether it be from flipping or short-term rentals or long-term rentals. Um, and... This month we're going to be, are you, this month we're going to be covering some of the evaluations that can be done. And we thought that would be a great thing uh, that you can kind of help walk us through a little bit how you went on this journey from, um, from being a high school teacher to now being a seasoned real estate investor. And how do people even get started and, and where does this all come from? So um, how are we doing, Anthony? We're doing good now. All right. I think we're good. I, I full disclosure, I did present on a different thing. That's why I was odd today. But uh well, let's start off. Thank you guys for that. That's awesome. So today we're gonna focus on how to actually evaluate properties. Uh in the past, we've been able to actually look at some of the Excel spreadsheets that we use and some of the pro formers that we use to evaluate all different types of real estate. Um, but today we're going to bring it down to basics and just focus on what are the evaluation metrics that we use. And today we're going to focus on the NOI, which is your net operating income. We're going to focus on cash on cash return, and we're going to focus on the cap rate, capitalization rate. And, you know, I'm sure Casey and Amanda will speak to this a little bit further as we go through, but these are probably, if not the most common in the top, at least five evaluation metrics that investors use to see how a deal is gonna return and if it's a good deal or not. So we hope today to just give you through a couple of different tools to use and also to uh, make sure everyone has a good understanding of that. And if you do, you'll really be on your way to start looking at properties, so. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I just wanna add, if you haven't joined us on any of these calls before, we're here for each other and we're here for you. So, you know, feel free to, Put a question in chat. You know, this is very informal, interactive. If you need us to repeat something, slow down, go deeper into something, or you have a question about anything, um, this is the place to ask it. So uh, don't be afraid to speak up and let us know your thoughts or if you, you know, want to go into something in a little bit more detail. And then hopefully as we go, um, we'll talk a little bit about those metrics and then both Amanda and Casey can give us how they actually use them and their experience with those returns, if they've been accurate throughout their deals and what to look at, what to know and pay attention to when checking those deals out. And you're going to be taking us through some real life ones that you are actually right in the midst of right now. Is that right, Anthony? That's right. We'll look at the cash on cash on a deal that we're under contract for right now to purchase in the next month and also the how we got the NOI there and the cap rate and all that good stuff. Awesome.
All right. So the, for a little little preface here, um, we always say Amanda and I and Beth about bringing the right tools for the job. So one kind of uh, FYI to start off with is that depending on the type of property that you're looking to purchase and what you're actually looking for out of the property for that real estate investment, whatever type of property it is, there may be a specific metric you want to use for that investment. So like I said today, we're going to be simple with the cash on cash cap rate and looking at NOIs and what to account for in that. But depending on the type of asset you're buying, you may lean heavier onto another metric when considering that property versus another. Um, does that make sense to you, Casey? Yeah, definitely. So like when you're saying what is your goal with this particular purchase, what are some of the potential goals that people might have in mind? So um, I put these two two things here, and I think this is two things that we always look at when we're looking at a property. Number one is what is going to be your goal with the property, right? So generally, I know, you know, my goal for real estate investing is to create passive income. Right. So for me, because of the type of job that I'm doing, I don't want to necessarily create a heavier workload to just make more money. That wouldn't make sense for me. Right. So for me, it would be more to just sell more houses if it was giving me more time. So if the goal is for a passive income, I'm looking for a property for the most part that I could put tenants in and, you know, have them cover the expense of the property, hopefully provide some NOI after that, after all expenses are covered. So I can basically loosen up some time now. But for somebody else, that might not be the case. Like Amanda. And the deal we were talking about today, which is, was it a flip, right? Your goal is not long-term there, right? You're muted. That's right. The deal that we were talking about today is about income generation. Right. So you're basically fine with trading off your, you're basically fine with getting some sweat equity on the outside, trading off your time for the money there, yeah. for the return. And for me, my personal goals is a little bit of balancing of both of those things right now, some income, immediate, right. some passive. And I think that's a good place to start. Um, the question is always, what is your time slash equity trade off on this deal? And is it worth it? And that's why it might be worth it for one person where it's not worth it for another, depending on what their goal is. So I just want to keep that stuff in mind today as we look at a couple of these evaluation tools. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about NOI. So your net operating income is all of the potential income, your rental income for the most part, and your ancillary income on a property that's going to be generated. This could be as simple as actual monthly rent from the tenants. And then it may also be in addition to, um, they might pay for a parking space. They might pay for laundry. And let's say you charge them, I don't know, maybe you upgrade the Wi-Fi or something like that, right? And then it's going to take away all the direct operating expenses for that specific, specific property. So this is going to be all of your expenses except for your debt on the property. And that's the key component here. So it's all of your operating expenses, but not including your debt. So any of the financing, the mortgage or anything like that is not included. Your taxes are, but just that mortgage payment, your principal interest, it is not. All right. Casey, you want to expand on that a little bit further? No, I mean, that, that pretty much covers it as far as uh, NOI. Awesome. Now, NOI is going to be one of the you know top tools that basically for us to actually look at some of these evaluation metrics, um, we need to always determine what the NOI is. And the first thing that we're, I'm always doing when I'm looking at a, a basic rental property, whether it's one unit or eight, is I'm first thing is, is calculating the NOI. After I've established the rental income and any other income I can generate on the property, and a great thing to do is always look for places right where you can generate more income maybe from the previous owner, maybe they weren't charging for parking and they have an opportunity to, maybe there's another portion of the back, like a uh, ADU an accessible dwelling unit where you can create more rental income, right? And you want to boost up that income as high as you can and obviously lower the expenses. So two, two pieces of advice I would say is if you're, if the property is currently being used as a rental property, you can always ask, hopefully the owner has one, a NOI should basically a balance sheet showing a p l right showing how much money they're getting income and what the expenses are on the property because the more accurate that you can fill out your noi sheet when you're doing your cap rate and your cash on cash uh the better place that you'll be um so let me ask you because i think like i was saying in the beginning 
a lot of the barriers that come in and when Casey and I were talking before we um, joined the, uh, when we were talking about preparing for the seminar today, Casey uh, was saying, and I completely agree with this statement that everybody always says that they want to be a real estate investor. Um, some people say that they are going to, that they will one day, but very few people actually do it. And in my opinion, I think the barrier that people think that they have is the finances, is the money. But in reality, I think that the barrier truly is to be a successful investor as finding the right property. And if you can find the right property by using these tools, then the money part actually becomes really easy because you can find the money. Someone's going to give you the money if you can prove that it's a good, that it's a good investment. So being creative by using some of the um, maybe less uh, known elements about the property, like Anthony's saying, like, okay, maybe this garage could be converted into something else. Like, what are the ways that we can really make this a great investment? So creativity in ways like that and a little bit of research can be really your best friend and is more so more valuable than having a big bank account to fund the purchase sometimes, right? Yep, hundred percent. Did that come in handy for you, Casey, with your with any of your investments? Yeah, I mean, when I when I first started uh, investing, I was living paycheck to paycheck and was a high school teacher. I had a master's degree, making thirty five hundred bucks a month, so income, you know, was was quite low at that at that point, you know, and and now I've I've been able to progress to you know purchasing. I think I'm on now my third property of over a million dollars um, that I've been able to qualify just off of uh, income. Obviously, I wasn't you couldn't do that in 2016, 2017 when I first bought my first property, but I've scaled it up over time to the point where now I can buy these larger assets and take on, uh, you know, quite a bit more debt because I have, uh, you know, the assets to to back it up. Very good point. Yeah. So we got here. All right, so let's start with the cash on cash return. So now that you've calculated your NRI, right, you've got your projected rental income, and you understand what all of your operating expenses are on the property, except the debt, you can then begin to look at your cash on cash. Now, your cash on cash, the main thing is that it is going to factor in all expenses, including your debt on the property, right? I personally love the cash on cash. It's really, for the most part, for what I've been buying for rental property, uh, it's the number one kind of uh, metric that I look at. And so a cash on cash return is the rate of return often used in real estate transactions that calculates the cash income earned on the cash invested in a property, right? So it's specifically, this is a deal that we're doing right now, the total equity invested on the deal, right? You'll see here initial equity for the purchase. This is the down payment. You got all of the closing costs involved, 17,000 right here. Now, other initial equity spent on this deal is zero because there's tenants there now and there's really no major capital improvements. But let's say you were gonna factor in that automatically you have to do a roof and siding. You may add this to 20,000 and then this would increase to 64,500. Muted. Give us the details of this house. Like this amount of equity, is needed for what type of house? Um, because this happens to be one that you're under contract on right now as we speak, right? Yeah, yeah. Now this so one is a little bit different though because this is a property that we're able to secure with conventional financing. So I did have to qualify it off of my own income, number one. And so it's some, you have to have the income to kind of back it up. Um, but because of that, I was able to put down a smaller down payment on this. So it wasn't structured as an investment loan necessarily. It was more of a conventional loan. And a lot of people will choose just to do a conventional mortgage. There's lower interest rate. There's a lot of very valid reasons to just use a conventional mortgage when purchasing um, a second home or a rental property, you know, that maybe you use, or um, there's all kinds of different options out there. So this, this was a $450,000 home, roughly. Five fifty. Five fifty. And so you're putting 27,500 down. Right. So a lower down payment than some other programs might 
yes. might require. So there are definitely some advantages and disadvantages to all different kinds of programs that are out there. It just depends on the situation and how you can evaluate it. Right, exactly. And then the closing costs involved are approximately $17,000 in this house. Um, and obviously when you do any numbers, you bump them up, but they're probably more about 15, but we bumped them up a little higher. And this um, house is in a high closing cost state in New York. Yes. Casey, yes. what do your closing costs generally look like for something like this? I'm going to, I'm going to always try to negotiate it, you know, down to as little as nothing, but, uh, um, I think uh, probably half of if you're at if you're at five fifty probably half of that for closing costs. Yeah. Um, anything that you're looking at in particular when you're doing your cash on cash return calculations? So, uh, kind of how I got started um, was actually purchasing properties uh, as owner occupied uh, homes. So, uh, I think I bought. Because I'm a veteran, I use my VA loan twice out of the first three purchases that I used. Um, I mean, when you're looking on cash on cash return with an investment that you didn't pay any money to move into, it's infinite, you know. So um, I actually went zero percent down VA, one percent down conventional, two percent grant. It was a three percent down option, uh, and two percent was granted or you know free money. And then my third purchase was a VA loan again. So I had three properties, a duplex, a quadplex, and a single family that combined between the two or three, uh, I only put 1% down on one of them. Um, so cash invested on and cash on cash return was an easy equation, you know, initially when I had uh, those first three properties. But um, what I've allowed myself to do is those properties were purchased in 20 uh 17 18 and 19 and i have uh used a 1031 exchange to uh throw the equity that i've built into the from those properties into larger assets awesome. nice so cash on cash for you is a was a no-brainer if you're looking at that metric on that one um yeah. yeah so to give just to go back a little bit on how it works guys so all it's all of the money that you're going to actually use to purchase the deal that's the main thing on cash on cash so for KC, because of the financing he was able to take advantage of and was smart to do it, his cash and cash is going to be so high because it's your total equity invested divided by how much money every month or every year, whatever your total amount every year, the property spits out. So if you're going to put in zero bucks and you make a hundred bucks, there you go, off the rip, right? So um, yeah, yeah, my my uh, very first property, uh, again, duplex, put 0% down. Uh, I use the 1031 exchange now and rolled it into a short-term rental and kind of a, a luxury uh, destinational uh, cabin, I guess you could say. Um, and that grosses me, you know, quarter million upwards of 300K a year. Um, now that's gross, gross income, but the difference of you know, not, not, you know, not having ever made that purchase back in 2017, which would have obviously not got me to the investment that I, that I hold now that makes me, you know, almost 300 K a year. Um, it's, it's substantial. Absolutely. And now, you know, we're not going to talk too much about it today, but just equity in general and just the growth there, right. And having someone else being able to pay down that mortgage. So you're getting that appreciation in the meantime at a hundred percent is huge. And that's where you're able to scale with that. Is that what you were thinking, Casey, when you went from your first investment to your second investment? As far as thinking about what? Um, that someone else was going to be paying the yeah. Pay. yeah. So, so your main so your main focus when you went from investment number one to now I'm gonna have two to three is I'm just as long as these are increasing in equity, someone else is paying it. I'm increasing my assets over time, then keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, I would say, you know, because I was in a position to purchase the one, the first one as a owner occupied home, uh, it was more or less, okay, this is what a given expense on a monthly basis would be as far as my housing expense. Okay. If I purchase a house, so my monthly expense is basically eliminated or, you know, 80% of my monthly expense is eliminated. Um, and by the time I move out, it's, a, you know, a property that's going to generate income for me. Um, and that was really step one for me with, with investing was, 
you know, uh, a mindset of like, how do I, if I'm only making $3,500 a month, I can try to, you know, do side hustles. I can try to earn additional income, but I also, and that would raise my income, obviously, to be able to qualify and purchase stuff down the road. But I also wanted to figure out how could I eliminate or lower my expenses, which obviously your largest expense being your housing. I was trying to figure out a way to lower my housing, which included, you know, buying a, a property and renting out the rooms or, you know, buying a property and, and having it off, offset my you know, what would be my monthly expense. And then that really, so, you know, if I was able to increase my income to $5,000 a month instead of 3,500 and then lower my expenses from 2,500 down to 500, now I'm making, you know, or I'm netting close to $4,500 a month, you know, and I'm able to stash that away and save money far faster than, you know, just renting and trying to save a couple hundred bucks a month from my paycheck. Does anyone else have any questions so far before we move on to the next evaluation for Casey or Anthony? All right. All right, let's roll. All right, we'll talk a little bit about cap rate here, right? So now that we've established our NOI and we looked at our cash on cash, um, it's our net operating income on the property, or NOI, divided by the current purchase price, or the, let's say the you can do it at any time if you want by the current market value. But when I'm looking at a deal, you're doing it by your purchase price. Again, this is the same deal that we were looking at. The cap rate here, right, is 8.22 in the first year. It's your net operating income. So property brings in based on the rent after all operating expenses, 45,000 and change. And then you're, you divide that by the purchase price and that's going to bring it to your cap rate. And I personally use cap rate when I'm just considering, um, I should say one investment to another uh, outside of real estate, right? So if I know that for for me, um, besides the income factor, beside the passive income goal, if I can put my money into right now a 10-month CD, let's say with Capital One, which I just saw, and I can make, I think it's 5.12 or something um, in 10 months guaranteed with no risk at all. I can't touch that money at that time. And that's, I can get up over 5%. The minimum that I'm going to do a real estate deal, I, unless there's another metric that I love or there's long-term appreciation or something, is I'm going to at least want a seven and a half cap rate depending on the area. And your cap rate is going to is going to vary depending on the area that you're in. And the basic rule of thumb, just to pay attention to, and again, this depends on your goals, but the more risk, the more reward you want, just like any other investing. So if you're investing in, let's say, a C-class neighborhood versus a double A-class neighborhood, um, you would take a lower cap rate because there's less risk for the most part for a comparable property in an A-class area versus a C-class area. And that's how most investors will kind of consider cap rate when they're considering different locations of investments and different types. So it's a good way to compare if you're looking at multiple options, one from another. Yeah. Casey, do you use cap rate? What do you pay attention to? I, I use it sparingly. It's, it's definitely, uh, what a lot of larger, more, more commercialized development, uh, investment opportunities will use, uh, on a smaller scale because I haven't, you know, I have purchased properties and kind of rolled income into larger assets. Um, but specifically on any of the investments I have, I have not now it's, it's used a ton in our sphere and our, our, um, realm of, of work, but, uh, not with my investments. And do you use cash on cash often? Yeah. Cash on cash. I do. Um, like I said, the first couple of investments were a nice, easy equation there, but, uh, the, the premise for me when it comes to investing is it has to, it has to make, you know, and I'm not what one would say, you know, is a standardized investor, like, you know, you have lots of people out there, like if you can get them the number they want, they'll buy whatever it is. They don't care if it's in New York, they don't care if it's in California, like you get them the numbers at the end of the day and, and you run, you know, cap rate and you do take a look at the NOI and if it makes sense to them and the numbers that they want, they're, they don't care what, you know, versus, you know, for me, uh, every single investment kind of had uh, a different story or a different reason or rhyme as far as why it made sense at that given time or, you know, whether or not it was something short-term, whether or not it was something long-term. I have an investment that 
was probably my worst investment. And it was a investment made from a uh, personal life decision, you know? So there's, there's a little bit of uh, differences with every single one of my investments. And overall, I've, I've done very, very well. Um, the one where I made a personal decision uh, was not the best one, but um, you know, every investment that I have is, has kind of served its own purpose uh, at a different stage in my life. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, when did you feel like you had enough information or how did you decide that um, that investing in real estate? I mean, we went through kind of the income logistics of it by your personal situation. But when did you say like, OK, I have enough information. I don't need to figure anything else out. I just need to make this decision and make this happen. Was it because the opportunity presented itself in front of you that you saw a house? What was it that made you pull the trigger? On any of my investments or one specifically? Or... The first one. Yeah. So, okay. So that was almost a full year. And the story there is I lived in San Antonio. I was a high school teacher, first year teacher there. I had, uh, uh, the mindset and the desire to invest. Um, unfortunately, or I guess fortunately enough, I was informed I would not be offered the position the following year, so about January timeframe. But as teachers, we continue to teach through May. Um, unknowingly, not not you know backing myself up with people that you know I was educating myself ninety percent of the way, meaning I was finding the education myself and kind of learning. Um, from June of or July of 2016 to when I first made my investment, I mean, honestly, still now too, I'm I'm learning still eight years in, um, but I didn't have a lot of guidance. So in San Antonio, I I contracted I think three or four homes, and one I actually got all the way to nearly closing when they did a verification of employment, and you know that's when the notice that I was not coming back the next year kind of bit me in the butt. So when I moved to Dallas, uh. I had a house under contract in 30 days. I was ready. I was, you know, I had already done a lot of, you know, analyzing and looking at the numbers and what made sense, what didn't make sense, um, that I was ready to go as soon as something fell in my lap. And it, like I said, within 30 days, it did. And it made sense. And I moved forward with it, um, you know, and and to that, to this day, you know, obviously it's my oldest investment and I've since sold it, but that's the very investment that I, you know, have now a short-term rental that makes me a substantial amount of income now from it. So awesome. Yeah. And I, and I think, um, you know, it brings, it brings it up a really good point. I, the first thing I love to do when I'm looking at a property is throw it into the calculator. I look at the cap and I look at the cash on cash, but there are like, I'm be completely honest, right? This deal, this was an off market opportunity. I was buying this house anyway because of personal things, but long-term growth is really why I was buying this property and the location of the property, right? And I believe in the area and I believe in the value and I believe in those things and the type of tenants. And there's many other factors that go into it. It's on a large piece of land. There's a lot of improvement to up to bring the property, um, to put money in the property and increase its value like that, value add. Um, but sometimes these are just almost like maybe just benchmarks that you'll just throw in on a deal to get an idea of what you're looking at. You, of course, want to make sure you understand what your expenses are going to be on the property so that at minimum, they can cover it. But there's a lot of other factors that go into the type of investment, especially one that, relatively speaking, overall, totally into this deal off the rip at less than 50000 That's a pretty low number, right, compared to other things. So to be able to get a piece of property in an area that you're confident in may be very different for a different type of deal that I'm looking at. If it's strictly if I'm looking to do a 1031 and make a lot of money on it, basically, per month, that's going to change my life. As you can see, this this won't change anyone's life, $300 per month, really. So. <laughs> Well, it's also the the two properties that you have both talked about are properties and areas that you knew. The first property you bought, KC, was an area that you were going to be living in. The property that you're talking about, Anthony, is a is an area that you have a personal attachment to. But as you've gotten more confident or as your goals have changed or as you've grown as an investor, it seems that your thought process on being able to invest maybe in other places has changed as well. Casey, you mentioned now you don't necessarily just own homes that you've lived in or that are even in an area that you have intimate knowledge of. You branched out. Do you yeah. think that when you branch out, maybe this comes into a little bit more? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it goes back to the one that I keep bringing up, being being the cabin. Um, you know, I I knew I was going to sell that property and and earn a pretty substantial amount of income from that property. And up until that point, it had been one property after another property that I either lived in. I had two houses that I I, I um, essentially got a good deal on and and completely gutted and remodeled. Um, I had built a custom house that I am you know sitting in now, but I built it with a Airbnb suite into it, as well as an extra bedroom that I rented out, and that covered essentially my mortgage while still living in here. So um, you planned it that way as you were designing it to build it. Yeah, so yeah, I've been creative. I, I, whether you want to call it creative or I've sacrificed uh, a ton along the journey that finally, when it came to selling my first property and upgrading to another property, it was the first time. Um, and I sit here saying, and I, uh, I rented it out June, starting June of last year, and I've only been up once, but uh, my intent with the property was to buy it, rent it out, but also have it, you know, through being three hours away, something that I'm going to be able to take my family and dogs up to for the rest of our lives. Um, you know, it's a pretty, it sleeps almost 20 people. So it's something wow. that, you know, we can, you know, have now when, you know, we've got a baby coming in, you know, two months or something that we can have, you know, our, you know, son, who's a high school senior have, you know, his friends up for, you know, a high school graduation party, you know, whatever. So something that's going to be used uh, a little bit on the personal side, as well as still be an investment. So, um, you know, a little creative there, but a little bit of sacrifice in a sense where, um, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable maybe with a little less of a return, knowing that it's something that I'm going to be able to use personally. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to give advice to um, anyone who is looking to follow in your footsteps, what's the number one thing that you've learned and what's the biggest mistake that you now know for them to avoid? So I've had I've had a couple blunders in terms of uh, not investment properties that you know I've had I had to get rid of or I've lost substantially. You, they say you don't lose until you sell and you know, if, if I put a good amount of money into something, I'm just going to hold it forever. So uh, I have had, you know, some pretty substantial uh, remodels that went above and beyond my budget. I've had, you know, on the flip side, I've had some properties that I put very little to no work in and, and made a substantial amount of income from. Uh, but at the end of the day, when it comes to either direction, um, I would say do your due diligence. But um don't be afraid to take the jump. Um, be cautious and be smart with just like anything else you would do as far as making an investment in something. Um, but one of my favorite things I've seen lately is I think it's 39 of the last 44 years, home prices have gone up. So I like that odd. You know, I like that percentage of, of success, I guess you could say, at the end of the day, when it comes to purchasing a house. If you hold it long enough, you're going to be okay. Now, if I you, don't sell. I don't sell. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're looking to flip something, you know, having had no experience, I, uh, I have remodeled homes substantially. I've never flipped a home. Um, my goal starting at 27 and now being 34, uh, using my mom as motivation is I don't want to be a middle school PE teacher that she is at the age of 67 and finally retiring. I want to be able to, you know, retire in my fifties if I want to be able to do what I love, be able to have the flexibility. And, you know, I still remember her, you know, asking her five, six, seven years ago, you know, if she was ready to retire and she finally looked at her retirement and that wasn't anything of what she thought it was going to be. Um, and that's one of the main reasons I got out of teaching. It's also one of the biggest reasons, um, you know, I, I make sure to put money away and invest, you know, largely in real estate, um, because, None of my house, you know, none of my houses, knock on wood, unless you know something tragic happens, is falling down and and not being there tomorrow, kind of thing. Like these are assets that will be, you know, with me and with my family for decades to come. So, uh, I love that. Thank you so much for you know giving everyone that bit, and I think you know everyone has that piece of them, you know that time is ultimately our most valuable resource. And the older that we get, the the more we all realize it, whether you're 25, 35, 55, 75, um, 
you know, you realize that time is all we really have. So uh, when we are, we're able to find things to give us more of our most valuable resource, then uh, we start looking for more ways to get it, I feel like. Um, well, you mentioned that the biggest challenge or mistake was this remodel that went over or the budget that went over. Can you tell us more about what happened and um, how it happened and what now you know that you didn't know then? Yeah, I would I would say, uh, and this is probably just me. I've always kind of been cheap, um, and cheap kind of bit me in the butt when it comes to you know having to redo. Now it's one thing if you want to be cheap and have cheap flooring, right? It's another thing if you want to like I don't want you know the super nice countertop. I'm going to be cheap and have level one granite. It's not going to look the best, but it's not going to make your you know make or break you, right? I was cheap when it came to plumbing, so um, that came back actually just last year at about a $22,000 cut where uh, the money I, I thought I saved about two years prior to that, I wound up having to just spend two times as well. I, I got replumbing for about $10,000, which is incredibly cheap um, and uh, had to redo it two years later um, the right way. Um, still cheaper than retail, but I guess maybe if you include the cheap and then the second time I did it, we're getting probably 70, 80% of what I would pay having paid retail. But um, it's something that at the end of the day, uh, you know, PVC pipes underneath a house, if installed correctly and done well, is going to last 100 years, you know. So I'm not concerned that the expense I had to stomach last year is something that's going to reoccur on a, on a you know, annual basis. It's something that sucked and it's a lesson learned. Um, but uh, it's a property that I've had now for, three or four years and it's it's going to hold its own for you know probably the rest of my life nice well said we learned that we were learned that same similar lesson a couple of times <laughs> a couple times yeah <laughs> yeah can only cut costs and so many things when it comes to real estate the rest is just you're just delaying it right that's it that's awesome So we got a couple other, um, as far as talking about metrics and um, different ways to look at real estate, there are a lot of really cool tools out there now. You don't have to necessarily just go old school and find this all out on yourself. So Mash Advisor offers AI-driven ana analysis to find lucrative rental properties quickly, making investors access to profitability and different options. And there's also Deal Check, which is designed to help compare properties and find the best real estate deals. Basically, they're glorified calculators that are just a little bit easy to use. And then PropStream, I know you use PropStream, right, Amanda? Yeah. Yeah. So PropStream is just known for its its data and tools. And basically you can compare certain markets to one another when you're looking at real estate investments and understanding these metrics, having a decent pro forma calculator that we're happy to share with anybody who wants it. Um, and a couple of these tools now that there's a couple of different websites that are newer that are awesome where you can find data and it helps you analyze the data. And I'm sure soon we're going to be putting property metrics into an AI calculator. It'll be yeah. spitting out buy or not pretty soon so so how do you think that might affect your future real estate investments casey and anthony like do you see anything changing from where your thought process is right now to and, and you know on your trajectory what you've learned where you've come from how how that's shaping your future goals go ahead anthony for me i would say no um I think that, the, you know, the reason we started off with tonight is you have to understand what your goal is for investing and then what your goal is for the property. And another part of that, too, is sometimes we're so anxious to find another deal that when a deal comes up or it looks like a deal, you're almost like, oh, wow, you know, this would be great. This would be great. And there's so many different types of avenues. And when it goes into managing real estate, there's a lot of different things to know depending on the type of asset and different management type. So I do that all the time. And we have these conversations all the time, man. They're like, do we want to do that? Do I want a short, short term rental by the beach? Do I want to manage that? Is that really lining up with the goals that I have? Although it seems like a good deal. Is it for me? Is that what I want? And I have those conversations all the time. So as long as it lines up with the, my ultimate goal, and if there's a specific goal on that property and the numbers can work, then I'm good. And I think a lot of it is deal structure, which we talk about all the time. 
There's many, many ways to structure a deal. My, one of my favorite things in the world is creative financing because you can make a deal work for you in a way that it wouldn't have had worked before. So probably the answer for me is no. But. How about you, Casey? Yeah, I mean, I would I would uh, err on the same side of Anthony. At, at this point with what I've been able to build up, um, also... Now, uh, being recently married and a, and a kid on the way, um, no longer is it Casey making all the decisions. I've got a I've got another partner that uh, is going to be assisting me in making the decisions. Um, whether or not investments, you know, where we are financially, uh, create a little less cash flow, but a little bit more convenience and and um, likeness on our behalf, kind of like the cabin. Um, I know we uh, just got back from Colorado, and we'd love to have something up there eventually down the road uh, to be able to go up, uh, you know, over the winter with being in Texas, we get, it gets pretty hot majority of the year. So to get, you know, some snow and a wind, you know, winter quotation specifically in quotation marks there, cause we don't get winter really here. Um, you know, investments may look a little bit different down the road. Um, but the investments that I've made in the past, you know, past seven, eight years uh, have put me in a position to where, you know, I'm, I'm not needing a set, cap rate. I'm not netting, needing, uh, you know, to hit a specific number. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've done very well and, and cash flow is, is great on the properties that I have that, you know, investing may look a little different, you know, for the, the next few. Super. Congratulations to you. Um, so, I mean, it's just so great to hear that it's not, the select few that are able to make this happen. Obviously you are, um, you know, you, you, you have a great combination of things to your advantage or that you're putting to use to make this happen. Um, but really it's things that can anyone can have access to in different ways. And it's just a matter of um, getting surrounded by like-minded people coming to things like this and then deciding that today's the day, right? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, you know, with the content I make content that I make and the people that I speak to, uh, as I just had a first time home buyer purchase with his soon to be wife, a house that needs a substantial amount of work that they're gonna live in. I shouldn't say substantial amount of it's just dated and needs some foundation work. Um, they're gonna live in it and rent out the other rooms not really what one would, you know, picture as their first time house, you know, you think of, oh, I qualified for my, you know, house, it's going to have nice countertops, and it's going to have everything I want. Um, they're going to sacrifice a little bit here. And it just shows on the appraisal, where they have it under contract, or have it on contract, we just funded probably an hour or two before this call, um, 395, and it appraised for 498. Um, so, and that's, wow. the that's without any, you know, work done on their behalf. They closed on the property and what they opt to do from now, it could easily be a $600,000 house if they put some, you know, updates into it. Um, but they're walking in the door with, you know, almost six figures in equity. Um, do we have time for me to ask one last question? Because I know we're kind of coming to the end of our, our session here. But I think that's a really good point and something that we hear a lot of right now is there a market that's better for investing than others? Or is this a good market for investing in real estate? So I'll piggyback off of the same situation here. So his mortgage is going to be $3,400 a month. It's an FHA loan um, because he basically, for qualification reasons, uh, he was on the top end of what he could qualify for. Um, and it's he's sole income right now, meaning his soon to be wife is is going to be stay at home. Um, so not a ton of flexibility with income wise, but he was able to qualify for it. He it's a four bedroom, so he's going to rent the two, or two or three other bedrooms, generate income from rent from roommates there, um, and then eventually do some work to it, refinance to a conventional loan, maybe do a cash out refi, uh, pull some of that equity out. But he's got, I think, a seven around a seven percent interest rate. Um, he knows long term. Uh, well, I shouldn't say long term, but he inevitably rates are going to go down. You know, the big question is where you know how far they go down. Um, you know, and and 
I think every single buyer and investor will be watching rates as they they start to come down. Um, at what point, what it when it makes sense to refinance and and confirm that that rate is you know a rate that they're going to be comfortable holding long term. Uh, he's comfortable with the rate that he has now, but he also knows um, you know numbers may look even better uh, when it comes to uh, the future and and where rates may lie, especially with the built you know the built in equity that he has in the property. Fantastic. And that's such a good point. And I've been thinking the same thing when looking at any deals. And sometimes it's tougher when you're talking about someone who's just looking at it as to live in the property, it's sole use, and not rent any of it. Um, like we know that we don't say uh, date the rate, right? But um, from an investment standpoint, if you're saying, okay, this is my rate, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a fixed mortgage, my rate's not going to go up, right? Worst case scenario, that's where I'm at right now. If I can make these work, if I can refinance to a five and five and a quarter in three years, it's awesome. Right. Yep. Yeah. I've got my, that cabin is a million dollar note and I'm paying $6,300 a month in interest. It's not something I love to do, but when I'm generating North of $10,000 a month in income, it, it covers my mortgage and it covers, you know, everything else I need. But I'll tell you what, if, if I get that 8% down to a six, five or, you know, whatever I'm, I'm, it's going to be one cash cow as far as exactly. Cow. That's so it work in, in a very difficult market to make it work, which is what this is all about. So if you can do it now, mm -hmm. great. That's great. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and, you know, getting us all um, a little bit more off our butts to, Think bigger, realize that if you set the goal, you can absolutely come up with a way to make it happen. Sometimes it might be unconventional. Sometimes it might mean a little sacrifice from the way people generally buy their first house or live for a short period of time, but you make sacrifices for a short term to get where you want to be in the long term. Hey, appreciate you guys uh, for having me and, and, uh, I tell people, you know, sacrifice is ultimately going to dictate, you know, your your result. If you're, you know, I never push people to to jump into investing and I never tell people to do something they're not comfortable with, but you know, you look at my story if if I would have never invested in real estate, my life would look completely different. That's so awesome. Well, thank you Anthony for sharing um, you know, your immense detailed knowledge. And if anyone has any questions on any of the slides or how to analyze a property, Anthony is always so generous with going through spreadsheets and sharing the spreadsheets that are used on a really daily basis around our office, looking at things and uh, happy to get those over to you. So I hope everybody has an awesome um, holiday weekend this weekend and uh, getting a little bit of touch of spring wherever you might be. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again, hopefully at our next seminar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Casey. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys.